Welcome to AgriTalk, and it is summer, and sometimes when I drive past the fields and stuff, I wonder how, how the, the livestock are doing out there in the heat or the rain, storms, and different things. So uh, we have somebody here from OSU, and we're going to talk to them how to take care of your beef cattle during the summer, so stay tuned. Hey, glad you could stick with us, and uh, Dwayne Rigsby and uh, the guest is at the South Centers. Tell, tell us who we, you have down there with you. Hey, we're at Piketon, my, or my, I'm at Piketon, and I have Steve Boyles here with me from, uh, from OSU or Ohio State University in Columbus, and he is a, uh, a beef specialist in the nutrition and, and, and that part of the field for the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Science. Steve, welcome to the show. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, meet with us and give us a little bit of information. Uh, tell us just a little bit about yourself and, and how long you've been with the university and, and what your your title is and stuff right now sure uh, Steve Boyles OSU beef extension specialist I've been at Ohio State for 27 years uh, supposed to work with producers with their different sort of issues mainly trained as a ruminant nutritionist but get into some different areas but today it's about the environment and we're going to talk about how that affects uh, nutrition and the overall health of these beef cattle that are out there mm -hmm. uh, today that's awesome and, and you've brought some slides with you so yes. uh, you know with no further ado let's talk about these and, and uh, let's see what we've got all right uh, <coughs> Well, nothing like something simple. Let's start right. off with a little bit of physics. Yeah, that's quite a math <laughs> problem you have there. Yeah. And really, it's about maintaining body core temperature. If you think about yourself, uh, one of those things is radiation. You stand out in the sun, you're going to get warmed up. Mm -hmm. And then, well, it's called conduction. If you're standing on a hot surface, that's going to affect how you're going to feel about uh, the comfort of the day. Um, let's say one of the things we'd like to do in the summertime when it's hot is go to the swimming pool. Well, there's conduction there with the cold water, but when you get out, you're even cool because that water starts evaporating off of you. And then uh, the one thing that keeps us warm, we're not snakes, is we can maintain our own heat production or body core temperature. So our own heat production is also part of comfort of our body core. Also, what we're wearing also affects how hot we're going to be, and even the color of our clothing. Uh, if you wear a white t-shirt, you're probably going to be cooler than if you wear a black t-shirt. That's just that absorption. And this slide right here just shows a different coat color and how they're better suited to different environments. That white coat color is going to reflect more of the light, uh, whereas a black coat color is going to absorb more of that light and turn it into to heat. Not not to say you can't have black cattle <laughs> in hot environments. Uh, also, uh, the uh characteristics of that hair coat on the cattle. Uh, if you work in the farm industry, you're going to notice cows get kind of furrier or hairier in the wintertime. That stands out from the body. Whereas in the summertime, they lose that winter coat and it becomes quite smooth and therefore easily, more easily reflect that light to handle the heat that is of, of a time in the, uh, in, uh, in the summer. Emestivity is just what sort of, think about the surface you're standing on. Uh, cattle can get really, really hot on concrete and we have to make sure we check those animals frequently or get them off the concrete. Whereas if they're on grass, that's much less stress on those animals uh, where they're standing out in some grass. In fact, if the grass is a little bit taller and hiding the soil or hiding the dirt, that actually makes that overall cooler for the animal versus standing on ground that doesn't have a lot of grass on it. That can get rather warm too. So producers need to realize that. Not only the animal, but that environment that they're currently existing in uh, and the environmental temperature. 
We actually have three layers of insulation. I'm talking about we, but cattle the same way. First thing we have is that tissue insulation. We have the skin. There's fat along with that skin. So that's insulation to protect us, help keep us warm uh, in cold weather. Also, we have external hair or fleece that is there to, depending on the environment, you think about sheep, uh, th that's good to have that fleece in the wintertime as a heavy duty insulation. It can work for a little bit in the summertime, but eventually they wanna shear those animals to remove that sort of insulation. We also have hair insulation. You know, the hair or the air between hair follicles helps hold heat or resist it. So though there's three different levels of insulation that animal mammals that we have for temperature control to release heat or try to hold it in. Now I had one question, I don't know if it's off topic or not, but I'm, which is more dangerous? Because I'm always concerned about the, the livestock out in the field when it's like zero or 20 degrees or 20 below zero. Is the heat worse or the, the extreme cold? Um, probably heat is uh, probably more difficult for, for animals, uh, even for us, in all honesty. You can always put on another coat in cold environments, whereas in the hot environment, you literally have to change your environment, air conditioning is what we would use. Whereas the cattle out there in that, the environment is what it is. So in the cold environment, we just talked about hair coat, it will change uh, to a rougher hair coat uh, to, for insulation. And actually, they actually, the heat production I talked about, uh, they are able to create a lot of heat in, in, inside. They have what I call heat of fermentation. When you feed hay to a cow, well, the cow doesn't digest that hay, it's actually the bugs inside, and that's a big fermenter. Think of it, that the biggest, the rumen is a big fermenter, and if you feed them a bunch of hay, even a blizzard, it'll probably melt off the back of their, their bodies because of the heat of that fermentation process. So appreciate that question, but yeah, uh, heat is the one I probably pay more attention to. In cold, if I can get them out of the wind, and normally here in southern Ohio, if cows are calving in January and February, it's not unusual to calve them out in, uh, Oh, out in the open, not in a barn. But I want, what I want them is on the south side of a hill or ridge, out of the wind. So and, they, and they will wind, gather together. Uh, think, and, go ahead, Mike, sorry. Yeah, they'll gather together, I think, and stand in clusters to, to maintain some heat, too, I think. Right, yeah. It, it, they tend to, when there's cold or rainy, seems like they do cluster a little bit out in the field. Do... do um, when you said check them for temperature back on a, on a couple of slides, how do we do that? Is there, I mean, other than uh, you go out and feel them, do you have a tool? Should we, I mean, what is that? Uh, I know there's little guns and things that's like infrared things. Is, is that what it is or is there something else? No, I literally just, <laughs> just check the temperatures. Okay, uh, just outside. Yeah, okay. if, if it feels hot to you, it definitely feels hot to a cow. Mm -hmm. And the opposite, we were just talking about cold. Mm -hmm. uh, for them, 40 degrees is great. Yeah. Uh, they're not stressed at all at that temperature, mm -hmm. whereas they can get hot perhaps sooner than we do. Okay. So by all means, check that temperature, and whereas you, you mentioned that gathering together, mm -hmm. they've probably found a place where there's not a lot of wind, yep. and so they're going to gather up. Whereas I'd expect cattle that are in hot environments, they might gather up underneath a shade tree. Yeah. yeah. But they're also producing heat off each other, yeah. so that's not a great thing either. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're, they've chosen the, the shade versus uh, yeah, right. fighting away from their temperatures. Right. So in hot, they may spread out right. to get away from each other. Okay. Back or they could slide. stand in a pond, Mike, I said. I, I guess, guess they, they could stand, stand in a pond, pond also. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. The conduction I mentioned, uh, cool, cool water mm -hmm. uh, helps them uh, reduce some of that heat. Uh, you 
you talk about hogs that like to lay in the uh, yeah. in the mud. That's not an instinctual thing. They don't necessarily love mud, but right. they do like the cooling like the coolness effectiveness yep. of uh, on their bodies. Mm -hmm. The one thing you have to watch out where get off topic, but I, I love getting yeah. off is with mm -hmm. hogs sunburn. Oh yeah, I've, I've heard that. Uh, uh, I've noticed uh, se several around here the uh, people that raise hogs they talk about sunburn. White uh, white hogs especially. Yeah, very much uh, more sensitive because of yeah. the quote unquote the, the fair skin, the pigment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to make sure that uh, they don't get exposed to too much sun. Or, or in fact, with hogs, uh, some people would use snow fence uh, as shade, and, and I don't mind that with cattle. Yeah. But uh, those hogs get underneath a s uh, snow fence that has slats in between. Yeah. Well, you can have some red striped stripe, hogs. striped ones. <laughs> well, interesting. So, so if you do something yeah. like that, put straw or hay on top of that, yeah. so it's not uh, that intermittent that light sense. and shade. Yeah. Okay. So what we uh, so next how slide. How does a farmer <laughs> take care of the uh, the cattle who are out in the field? Are are there things you should look for for stress in the animals? And and then what do you do? Absolutely. Okay. I we will get to that. Let's go ahead and get back to the yeah. slides. It's a good question. But leading up to that, uh, this is just well, we talk about sweat. Cattle sweat. We sweat. It's not necessarily the sweat that cools us off. It's the evaporation of the sweat off our bodies. Mm -hmm. Think of yourself. You've just taken a shower. If you really want to cool off, stand in front of a fan. So that's going to make you feel cool. What about these animals and evaporation? Uh, and do they sweat? Well, chickens don't sweat. They pant. Yeah. Cattle, they sweat and they can pant. Horses sweat a lot, <laughs> but they don't pant much. Pigs, uh, not much of anything. They don't sweat and they don't pant very well. I mentioned this is that uh, we're in county fair season. Mm -hmm. uh, people need to be especially sensitive to hogs. Uh, if they're panting, uh, that's a situation that something needs to be done, uh, say at the fairgrounds, to address that. Yeah. Well, with this sweating, th this shows uh, how many uh, glands that they have. Humans, we've got like 2,000, pigs none, sheep a few, uh, cattle a few more, and it depends on the species or within breed. Mm -hmm. Those uh, Hindu or Zebu type cattle, Brahmin, have more sweat glands than say we would find in cattle here really? in Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about the environment that a lot of those Brahma cattle live in. Mm -hmm. And there's a opposite to that. If you're a really good panter, you're a lousy sweater. So chickens are kind of in yeah. that realm. Yeah. Uh, or dogs. Dogs. Dogs, yeah. Don't sweat, but they're great at panting. Whereas I just mentioned the hog, well, it's just challenged either way, but uh, panting is not one of their strengths. Yep. So, and there's a, even a difference in panting. How do dogs and chickens pant? It's very shallow. I'm not sure everybody's watched a chicken uh, pant, but we're probably all familiar with a dog. How yeah. fast it is. They, they're, that breath when they're hot is much more rapid yeah. than you and I in a normal breathing uh, behavior. That's because it's very shallow. It's not taking that air all the way down to the lungs. It's just crossing over in that passage, rapidly bringing in cooler air, rapidly removing the warmer air. So they're really good panters. Whereas cattle, if they're panting, yes, they can do it, but it's not in a situation where we want them to stay. If you've got cattle panting, it's time to move them into the shade, or if you're working the cattle, hey, it is time to back away and let them get their breath, literally. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to be careful, and sheep are the same way. So we have to look at their behavior to see where, where their situation is. Are they hot or in, they, or in a normal breathing environment? So if you see those animals pant, panting, it's really time to say, whatever I'm doing, I need to change what I am doing. Mm -hmm. Would having a, a water source like a pond or, or something be a good thing or does that become a hazard at some point? No, well I mentioned maybe one hazard, but in general though they've got to have it. Uh, a beef cow's rumen can hold 50 gallons of fluid. Uh, 
the Holstein dairy cow, 75 gallons. They want water. And it's been said before, you don't know how much water a steer will drink until you have to carry it to them. And there's probably more than one 4-H or FFA student out there gained an education in water need uh, having when they have that steer mm -hmm. or heifer at the county fair. That's and right. they've got to bring the water to the animal. So they need a lot of water. How much? Uh, as much as you can get to them, I'm going to use that rule yeah. of how much to get there. I leave the ag engineers on uh, 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 diameter of pipe. Uh, a big pipe has less friction. If you think about it, where water comes in contact with a pipe, well, there's friction there to slow down the water. So you have to think about the diameter of the pipe. Uh, but they need all that they can get. Also, just saying, yeah, I got water in the field. Is it accessible? Yeah. Uh, what if the shade's at one end of the field and it's a big field and the water's at the other end? Uh, I think those cows are going to be challenged. But we can use water as a grazing tool. I've worked with operations that have portable waters and they hook them to a four wheeler. They'll drag them to another part of the field and hook that up to plastic pipe or some plastic pipe and use that to actually move the cattle around the field because the cattle will follow the water. So it needs to be accessible. Uh, I don't necessarily worry so much about him what the temperature is. Uh, I do prefer, uh, if I have black plastic pipe and in the summertime and that may be above ground, don't mow the grass close to where the pipe is. Let that grass grow over those pipes and that helps as added shade to keep that temperature uh, moderated. I can think of one situation where an animal can have two much water. Uh, from personal experience, I didn't do this, but some neighbors borrowed my family's draft horses and used them to put up silage. Well, they water foundered those horses. What that means was they, they worked those horses hard and then they let them go to a water trough and drink all the water they wanted. That caused dilation of blood vessels in the legs, and that's water founder. And that permanently, can permanently, injure the horse. So, if you have a really hot horse, by all means, let it have access to water. But keep that bridle on it. Let them sip, let them sip, let them sip, pull them away. Let them so, come up again, let them sip, but control how much water they got while they are hot. Can that s same thing happen to a cow or a steer? But, but, but you typically don't have bridles on those. No, no. Um, can they just, when they're out in the field and say there's a stream of water, will they just drink and drink and drink and cause that problem because it's so hot? Oh, well, I'm, with the horse situation, we have controlled the access to the water right. because we're riding that horse or working the horse. Yeah, we're we're forcing him to sweat a lot yeah, more. Yeah, and not drink. Yeah. We're making that decision. Right. Whereas it's very, very hot and there's a stream running through the pasture. Mm -hmm. The cattle are likely at some point decide for themselves, I am really thirsty. Yeah. I'm getting out of the shade and go over and get water. Right. Okay. So I've not seen it, I'll put it that okay. way, yeah. in cattle. And that's my reasoning mm -hmm. why maybe I haven't seen yeah, it. Well, yeah, well, that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So we can check to see. Uh, this is a G whiz kind uh -huh. of article on energy. We often think about how much energy does an animal need. Well, this slide just shows it's different organs uh, that require different amounts of energy. Uh, the liver needs energy. Hmm. I'm not sure my tongue and teeth need a whole lot of energy, but the liver requires a lot of energy and helps control thermal temperatures, that body core temperature. I've got a couple slides here on the thermal neutral zone. There is a temperature for everybody, it's different for everybody, where you feel hot. Mm -hmm. There is a temperature at the other end, the lower critical temperature, where people feel cold. I am blessed genetically to be able to maintain quite a amount of external insulation called fat. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> and so I don't get cold as soon as somebody that doesn't have as much of that external insulation. But even within there, within that thermal neutral zone, the heart doesn't have to work harder uh, or we don't have to create as much energy. Our metabolism is just at basal. Whereas at cold temperatures, hey, we've got to create metabolism to help keep the body warm. Cattle are the same way. At the opposite end, animals have to create energy to help keep maintain or minimize that body temperature. That's hard to do. To the previous question, you know, where, what's more critical? We can always put on extra clothes to help regulate that lower critical temperature. It's kind of, when you're hot, uh, we're kind of limited what we can do to minimize that increase in body core temperature. Some of the things we can do, uh, and this is the same picture, just a different added feature. Uh, at lower critical temperature, metabolism goes up. At upper critical temperature, metabolism goes up. What can we do to minimize that increase? Not eat. <laughs> as, we, as it gets hotter, animals will reduce the amount they eat. Yes, they will increase water uh, consumption to help modulate that body core, but also they may reduce how much they're going to eat. And think of ourselves. In a hot environment, we probably don't eat as much as in a cold environment. This slide is a simplified version of just showing what happens to an animal. At average temperature, it's kind of a, a, a horizontal line. Whereas it gets colder, intake's gonna go up. Uh, if there's a rainstorm, deep mud, that's gonna cause the animals to eat less. A cool night, uh, they're gonna maybe try to eat a little bit less. A hot night, even less. Mm -hmm. So uh, that temperature, in a feedlot environment, if if I'm feeding cattle twice a day and it's really hot, I'll probably feed 60% of the diet in the morning. Or, I'm sorry, 40% in the morning. Uh, they're hungry. I gotta feed them. So I'll feed about 40% in the morning. Then after the heat of the day, I'll feed 60% of the diet where that heat production is gonna occur, but trying to minimize it. Whereas in a cold environment, maybe I'm gonna feed a lot of it uh, at another time. So we can adjust how much we feed based on how hot it is. Now, temperature also affects digestibility of forages. So let's look at forage and temperature. So temperature, affects the animal, plants behave in a different way in their growth patterns with temperature. What this shows is, this is showing the cell wall content. This is the stuff that makes plants stand up. This is not the stuff that's real digestible. Well, in a, as it gets warmer, that accelerates the maturity of a plant. So at normal temperature, uh, everything's gonna mature. But in a hot environment, that accelerates how fast a plant will mature, and the maturity I'm talking about is an increase in cell wall content. That's the stuff that make it stands, but doesn't make it digestible. So we have to keep in mind, this weather that we're having right now, probably accelerating some of that maturity in the plants that we wanna utilize to feed our animals. Well, high ambient temperatures, uh, this is kind of a restatement of that, where we saw increased cell wall content in the uh, previous slide, this just shows digestibility went down. That's what we just talked about in the previous slide, that's just showing that mm -hmm. that actually does. Even light intensity affects how plants mature. A cloudy day, they mature at a different rate versus in bright, bright sunlight. So plants change even with the environment, just as animals. As the animal, uh, that forage quality changes, younger animals need the less mature product. Uh, older cows, they can handle the rougher stuff. So if I've got a choice, if I've got some higher quality post pasture in one place, I might put the younger animals there. If I've got some stuff more mature, that's where the older mature animals that have lower requirements can go. Uh, the same way matching needs to pasture quality with crude protein. Normally the younger stuff is higher in protein. The more mature stuff is lower in protein. 
That way we can adjust where we feed animals. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we supplement animals? I'm starting to get questions from producers now, and this is because of earlier this year, we had the uh, a lot of moisture. Uh, farmers couldn't get into the field and plant their crops. Then we continued to have moisture, and farmers couldn't get into their fields and cut their hay down. Right. So we've got lower quality forage, even that has been cut for hay. Uh, and people are starting to get their hay sampled, yep. and some of it is of lower quality. Right. Yeah. right. And now, wouldn't, wouldn't it, isn't it also going to be because of we had all the weather? Uh, did, did we not get that first cutting, like you said? So we're going to be probably short of hay this this season? Uh, short of quality Quality, hay. okay, yeah. quality hay. Yeah. Uh, shortage possibly yeah. because there's some people that may only get one cutting this year. Yeah. So that could be the case as well. Okay. Uh, the first wave, yeah. though, is uh, quality mm -hmm. that uh, we're going to run into. Uh, so I'm getting questions from people, what do I feed mm -hmm. uh, to these animals, especially stalker cattle right now. Remember, we just talked about the hot weather out there. Yep. Stalker cattle are cattle that you bought in the spring, you're going to graze them during the summer and then sell them in the fall. Well, the forage quality has dropped off maybe more than normal. Mm -hmm. And so these people still want their those steers or heifers they've got on grass to gain. Uh, so I'm getting questions, what can I do? and they're interested in using some sort of supplement, kind of uh, as these slides indicate, maybe the response that we might expect. Uh, this is showing feeding corn from zero level to 4.2 pounds. And there is an increase in gain from 1.3 pounds to two pounds a day. That's the good part. Now, but there's a bad part. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, it's the law of diminishing returns. When we fed about 1.5 pounds of corn, we got an increase of about 0.25 pounds a gain, and the feed efficiency was like three to one. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, we've had to buy that corn. Normally, we don't have to buy that, but okay, mm -hmm. I bought the corn, I still got an increase in gain. Now, there was feeding over four pounds of corn. I'm getting two pounds a gain but it's taking over six pounds of corn feed to get that. Can I afford to do that? Am That's I just a, putting good you know. money after bad or however that goes? Yeah. There's a limit to how much we can do it with just, well, we're just gonna feed corn to them and expect that's gonna solve the problem. There's a limit to how much they can feed that and get efficiency. Now, Steve, I, I know you've got a lot more information to go. And w what I'd like to do is bring you back and right. we, we come back and hit hit some more of it. Uh, but uh, our time is just about out for today. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'd love to, to, to continue the topic and we'll, we'll add on to as we go. So I really appreciate your time. Mike, uh, I hope everything is, is doing well over there. And um, I'll let you uh, throw us uh, throw us at the end. Okay. Well, take care of your animals and your dogs and cats and everybody who's like sitting outside, big furry guys, they probably need to come in. Uh, and make sure everybody has plenty of water, including yourself. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on AgriTalk.